Hey guys, welcome back to Cult of Film. I am back with our man Night Patrol uh, of Future Funk DJ Stardom. And this week we are uh, we're actually back to anime. We are reviewing the 1987 classic Wicked City. But before we do, we want to humbly ask uh, those of you that have enjoyed the show, have watched the show, if you like what we're doing, please hit like, subscribe, please comment. Even if you hate us, help us out. Hate helps the algorithm too. So uh, without further ado, Mr. Night Patrol, Wicked City, what did we think? Oh, this is a classic. It's a classic of epic proportions and, uh, you know, both uh, the spectacle of uh, horror and uh, noir thrilling, supernatural sexuality, um, all those things. It has it all. And it really is a staple of, you know, um, 80s anime, 80s anime, 80s Japan. Um, it really is definitely one of those movies you can never unwatch once you see it, if you haven't seen no. it. No, that's true. That's true, man. We might want to have you project a bit more through the mask. I'm having a hard time. Okay. <laughs> if you're going to do the mask. Um, but yeah, Wicked City, 1987. This was one of those... Um, this was one of those blockbuster classics for me. This was one of those that I would, you know, from the I would rent from the anime section back in the day. And this was one I did not immediately pick up. I always gravitated more towards the sci-fi stuff. Not to say that Wicked City isn't sci-fi because it, it kind of is. Yeah, it has some But when cool. I did finally watch it, like you said, you can't you can't unsee it. It's it's really good. It is um it is really what would you say? I, this would be sci-fi horror noir because it's got action. It's got mm -hmm. supernatural, otherworldly stuff, you know, a healthy dose of, of sex. Um, and then certainly it's got the body horror elements of it too. Mm -hmm. Watching this the first time and second time, and this is watching it this last time, I was I really had my, my lenses on, you know what I mean? Yeah. I was absolutely convinced that this came from, uh, some type of manga or, or, or something. And because it just, it just feels like it had to have been a manga. And apparently it wasn't. This was a completely original production from Madhouse and uh, Yoshiaki Kawajiri. And it's beautiful. Uh, and I'm really kind of shocked that we didn't, um, hang on, based on, hang, hang on a second. Maybe it is based. Okay. No, I take it back. Okay. It's, it it's is based on a novel. novel series, it's not based on a manga. It's a series yeah, it was, of novels. Okay. It's based, it was called The Light Guard by uh, Hideyuki Kiguchi, who uh, made Vampire Hunter D. So, yeah. Correct. Yep. Correct. Um, yes, it's, uh, man, this was, this was, you know what, what struck me immediately watching this this last time is just how truly for a horror sci-fi noir film, this, this thing is gorgeous. It is really, really pretty. It is so, so smooth. And when you realize okay, this was done in 87, it's completely hand-drawn, you know, they, you know, while I'm sure that computer assist, nothing like what we have now, it is, it is so fluid, it is so sleek, without being over-polished, uh, it still has a grit to, to every frame, a really dark color palette, and just using color where you need to to emphasize certain things, which nobody seems to do anymore, uh, but no, this is a really beautiful, film um and i it, it really holds up there you know we, we talked off camera how there's you know certain anime that you know we saw as kids and we go back to revisit them and some of them it's just like oh i don't know if my my taste changed or something maybe just didn't age too well but for the most part i think this aged pretty well what do you think man oh it's definitely aged well this uh this particular movie was made i would say probably at the pinnacle of a kind of a new era for anime, you know, during the OVA era and the middle of the, you know, the eighties, um, you know, Japan's economy, they had the money to basically do whatever they wanted. So right. um, there was a lot going on and it's something I wanted to look into, uh, particularly the background about the making of the film more so than the actual film itself, but I actually did some digging. Um, I was checking out some of the other videos by like Kyoto video and bonsai pop. And uh, there's actually a lot going on here. There are the best and brightest that were really a part of this production and what made it so good. Kawajiri himself was definitely a perfectionist. He was like, yeah. um, he was an illustrator. He was a technician. 
and he definitely wanted to showcase the the, the technicality of um, you know his ability to create you know to create um, fluid animation right. um, through through this production. Um, and I learned a lot of things about it too. It was really interesting. It's like you know a little digging on um, on a you know Yoshiaki Kawajiri uh, created Madhouse in 1972 with Rintaro. Masao Marayama and uh, Osamu uh, Dezaki. So those names, if they don't ring a bell to any. Well, Ren Taru, watch, I know, I real, I definitely, we all know Ren Taru, don't we? <laughs> Dagger of Kamui, Metropolis, <laughs> Galaxy right. Express 999, Astro yeah. Boy. Um, Masao uh, Marayama, I didn't really know off the top of my head, but he was a film producer and he was responsible for probably just decades of, of movies, of anime movies that have come out just for generations and we're talking going all the way back to like the 80s um barefoot gen lensman uh dagger kamui also neo tokyo ninja scroll perfect blue vampire hunter D bloodlust paprika summer wars red line and wolf children so he's it, it went all the way up unfortunately i believe he passed away recently but yeah. his career was going all the way up you know throughout the the course of uh history uh, of anime history so he's been there and back from the very beginning um but also um, with Osama Dezaki, he was also, um, you know, famous for working on uh, Austin and Joe, the boxing anime. Um, you know, uh, I think Space Hunter Cobra. I think they got the name wrong, but Cobra, you know, mm -hmm. was a really popular anime from the 80s. And also Blackjack and the Professional. So he actually worked on Gogo 13, a, a movie we are. Yeah, uh, you see a lot of Gogo. You definitely, if you've seen Gogo 13, the <laughs> Professional, anime, yeah. you really see the parallels there. <laughs> Whew, man. Oh. Uh, and it's so cool to just I knew there was some history in there um, because these guys, they came from um, they came from uh, 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 Mushi Pro, uh, which was um, um, uh, a company that Osama Tezuka had um, back in like the, you know, back in like the 60s. And, you know, they um, Yoshiaki Kawajiri particularly was there kind of towards the end, the last few years. And after, you know, they left that studio, they all started up Studio Madhouse instead of going somewhere else. And that's where we have all these just legendary just uh, yeah. unforgettable 80s production. It's 80s basically and murderer's production. row of of legendary anime folk. Um, yeah, that that is yeah that's yeah. I mean, man, it's it's one of those things where, again, um, not to sound like an old head, but you youngins have got to look at this. You've got to watch some of this old stuff. I'm not saying don't like the new stuff, but I'm saying check this stuff out. Yeah, yeah, you gotta, you gotta see where this stuff came from. There's, I can't think of like again rewatching this. I'm you know looking at the plot and I've, because I've I, I've been looking for something new, something modern that I can maybe kind of sink my teeth into that, you know, would kind of match my taste and my interests. And I'm watching Wicked City and I'm thinking to myself, I don't know if they've done anything like this since. And you know, for the viewers at home, basically, you know, essentially in in the world of of, of Wicked City, you had the existence of something called the the Black World, which is an alternate dimension populated by supernatural demons uh, that are known to only a few humans. And there's sort of a, basically for centuries, a peace treaty between the Black World and our world of humans has been maintained to ensure relative harmony. Both sides of the continuum are, are protected by an organization of secret agents called the Black Guard, and specifically uh, from a group, uh, specifically protecting the world from a group of radicalized members of the Black World. And you basically have this guy, uh, Renzaburo Taki, who's kind of a salary man for a, 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 uh, uh, an electronics company by day, but he's a blackguard agent by night. Um, they're about to basically sign a new treaty. The, the you know our world is with the black world. He gets assigned to protect uh, a very um, dirty old man, perverted guy named Giuseppe Maiart, um, who's about a two hundred year old mystic. And they have to make sure that he doesn't get killed, basically, to ensure that this treaty is signed and everything's fine. They then throw sort of a wrench into the works. He gets a uh, really badass partner, a woman um, from the black world. And I, why am I blanking on her name? Her name uh, is Makie. Makie, that's right. And essentially, the two of them have to protect Giuseppe Maillard from getting killed uh, so that an all-out war between both dimensions doesn't occur and god it's i don't want to say more than that because it really is wow. so badass like it feels like the, the wachowskis had to have watched some of this had to have been i feel like there's got to be some influence yeah, yeah, yeah. just in just pure style 
Yes. Right? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. As a matter of they fact, they did. Okay, um, okay, all right. And um, I'm definitely I got to refer to one of my favorite documentaries about the history of anime, which I actually saw on the uh, Animatrix's bonus uh, a bonus feature. Um, you know, back in the day, like just like 20 years ago, but at that time during the thousands, that's where a lot of these, um, you know, renowned and established, um, renowned and established, you know, uh, directors and animators were, you know, working directly with Warner Brothers to actually help, you know, build that, you know, world and anthology around the Matrix. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, they, you know, a lot of people harp on the, uh, on the sequels and stuff. I'm probably one of the only person you're going to meet that ever liked the, 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 uh, the sequels, not Resurrections, that was a holiday special, but back to um, the documentary, there's so much, there were so many, it wasn't just Japanese animators and directors that talked in that documentary, but there's actually um, American producers. Todd McFarlane is a big anime fan, and he was uh, gushing um, about the history of anime and how works that came out of, out of Japan, particularly with Madhouse, inspired him with Spawn. Um, he's just gushing, and I highly recommend it. I believe it's... Um, I think it scrolls to screens. Um, I highly recommend that documentary. It's a really important piece of like just animation history, both American and uh, Japanese. Call you, let's get the title one more time. Scrolls I to believe screens. It's, this was a documentary. Yeah, scrolls to screens. Yeah, it was a three minute documentary. Animatrix. Yeah, from the Animatrix. It's so cool. Right. It's so cool because you get to learn about how much uh, the Wachowskis were so inspired through the anime of the 80s. Definitely Wicked City. Definitely Akira. Definitely right. stuff that they they love that stuff so much that they were inspired to create that story and create that world. And um, it's undeniable. And it's such a great like love letter. It's so great watching, you know, American producers and directors and comic book artists just gush over anime like that. I just right. you will love it. And so you get a chance you get to check that out because it's 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 a it's a it's a really cool little spectacle in time about, you know, um, how much these guys were inspired by. The, the people that are creating that created the movie that we're talking about today. So it's it's just timeless, you know, just, you know, this is, you know, you, you, you bring up um, something pretty timely for me, because one of the things I've been doing for maybe about past four or five years, at least, is really making a concerted effort to go and watch the movies that my favorite directors either really liked or were heavily influenced by, even, even if it, they weren't favorites. Um, movies yeah. that, they, that they enjoyed so it's you know again you know, i'm watching really again really you know lasered in on this viewing of wicked city and mm. there's just so much from the matrix on that you could you could see uh, not not like you know they were you know cutting and pasting because they definitely weren't yeah uh, the agents but, <laughs> right you know right just the agents and you know, all of that the um agents in the matrix the, the, the sense of foreboding the radicals all, even the 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 color palette one of the things that really sets this movie mm. apart is how incredibly dynamically directed this movie is. It's, it's one of those things where, obviously, it's 87. It's Japan's bubble economy. There's just money sloshing around everywhere. So we're getting these really lavish, rich, beautiful, fluid, original video animations. And that was something, too, is I was like, oh, this has to be, this has to be a feature film. Like, it is so good. It is... It, the, the scope of it is so good. It's so tight. It's so beautifully and theatrically sort of framed. Like this has to be uh, a feature, and it's not. It's an OVA, and it's only one. I, I say only to actually, eighty-two minutes. I'm watching actually, this, and it felt like two hours, and, and not in a bad way. But just, yeah, they yeah. pack so much in, and it just, it's amazing that they got they crammed basically a two and a half hour badass movie into eighty-two minutes. Yeah, it was actually, so the thing is, it was actually supposed to be a 35-minute uh, uh, OVA, but actually did 30, get... 35? 35? Yeah, wow. it's just going to be 35-minute OVA, and it actually got a full, it was actually became a full-length feature um, for 80 minutes. They got the budget because of, you know, the commitment to the to the pro, uh, to the the project. Um, okay. I think in exchange, what was ironic, and I just found this out right before, you know, we started this interview, apparently some of the, uh, some of the controversial moments in the scenes you know, particularly with, with Makie and, and the women in the, in the show, in the, in the movie, um, were actually something that was, uh, that was kind of the deal. It's like, you get a long, you get a bigger budget for the movie, you get to have it longer, you get to have it full length film instead of it being um, an OVA, but in exchange, you got to have certain, you know, certain characters doing certain things that could be controversial, you know, from, you know, from depending on a certain culture's perspective. So, 
Sure. Um, well, I, I, I just, I, I just, I, I, I need that. to correct something. I, although classified as an OVA by Japan Home Video, it was released theatrically in Japan by Joy Pack Film on April nineteenth, nineteen eighty seven, and Amazing. received its Western dubbed release by Streamline Pictures. Amazing. By the way. The version that we watched is the streamlined English dub on Amazon yeah, Prime. I, I prefer that fantastic. One. Yeah, yeah um, and that was released August 1993. Oh, 93. So, okay, I thought yeah, it was 91. Okay, yeah, years I later. I, I, that's the best way to watch it, in my opinion. Like everything yeah. else is, you kind of lose things depending on on a dub. Where there's just like the original Japanese and subtitles. Sometimes the the voice acting, although Japanese, may not really match what you're looking at. And I feel like a lot of you know, it's it's subjective. Sometimes streamlines kind of dubs. I feel like streamlines dub, and, and you know, streamline. They caught flack for it in the '90s, and, and it seemed like the hatred of them only only got stronger over the decades. Which I don't understand. People would get upset, and they did. Streamline and Carl uh, Carl Masick, or is it Machik? I'm not sure how we pronounced it. They did occasionally take liberties with some of the dialogue, and I think that was for the express purpose to make it fit. Uh, the mouths. Oh, and, I see. But they, I don't think they ever really changed. They, they never like overt. It wasn't like Robotech. It's not like they overtly changed something to make it fit something it wasn't. Um, but one of the things, what was I going to say? The um, so the simple fact of you know we're talking about how it's you know the action is is way up there. You have the sexuality aspect. You've got this incredibly slick theatrical sort of composition, well, it makes total sense because like you said, they got the budget and they did in fact uh, get a theatrical uh, release. This is one that I feel like um, if you're a more sensitive viewer and uh, if you're a viewer of anime and you've been watching it for a long time, you shouldn't be too sensitive. But if, 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 if Naughty Bits and you know gore bother you, this probably isn't the movie for you. <laughs> when I started to watch the one bit of it that did kind of, I was I was a little worried about the Giuseppe Maiar character because yeah. there's this there's a there's a there's a thing the Japanese do in in anime TV series in OVAs in movies or they used to. Um, it got really pronounced in the 70s and 80s and I think even in the 90s. They they had they, for some reason there always had to be an old perverted man in every goddamn show and I don't understand. Why that is? I mean, it works for Wicked City. I, I you know, it, it, it adds something to the character, the fact that it is a very sexual, dark world that they're building. So it completely makes sense thematically for the movie. But mm. that character, that archetype of character, pops up in a lot of other, you know, projects. And sometimes it really, it's like, oh, okay, this is not going to age well because technically this is supposed to be in all ages. This is yeah. definitely oh, not yeah. all ages. It's okay to have this, that type of character because it's wall to wall, yeah. naughty bits and 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 shooting and and you know blood yeah, and monsters. So yeah, be aware. Uh, mm -hmm. It's definitely you know uh, yeah ultra violent and ultra sexual. That's one of the things that uh, really defined a lot of anime at that time. And it's yeah. so interesting that you mentioned that you know people who are already used to anime like modern anime, how. You know, everything is very objectified and, you know, uh, sexualized and, you know, hentai is a full on blown out, you know, sure. industry. And right. the way that, the, you know, we talk about it, I won't get too much on it because, you know, I might ramble and say something that isn't really what my my true thought is. I could say it wrong, yeah, yeah. not the wrong way, but it's something about the execution between like modern anime in terms of how it how it, you know, uses, um, you know, sexual situations. Um, or sexual content, it's different from the way that you that is perceived or portrayed in Wicked City, particularly. And I, I think you know, there's that even with the element of, of horror in the noir, there's there's this mixture of of you know of style and and uh, you know uh, sexual and uh, sexual and, and visceral content that makes it worse than what is already being kind of presented in modern anime because modern anime is like everything's objectified you have bouncy boobs everywhere you have right. so much you know etch content you have so much yaoi and yui you know yuri uh content that is pretty much the norm you know in a sense that it can even use you know uh in a comedic sense but with wicked city the way they you know portray um these sexual situations you know um it's kind of done in a way that there's just a like you don't see like you know you're gonna see there's boobs there's a scene with 
a giant vagina, which is crazy, but it's just the execution of it of all that is kind of portrayed in a horrific way. How they use sexuality to portray um, horror and uh, suspense that right. you can't take your eyes away from it. And it is definitely uh, something that it's just like, it's just, it's just designed. It has way more shock value than what you would see nowadays, like modern. You know, and, and here's the thing, it, while it has that shock value, it is still in a way all more tastefully executed than I think a lot of, because now I feel like we're doing it for the spectacle. Whereas something like Wicked City, yes, there's naughty bits. Yes, there's monsters. There's naughty tentacles. You've got all of that. But it's not presented for the sake of shock. It is presented and completely integrated into the world that you're being presented with, this dark world, this, 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 this darkly sexual, uh, darkly violent world. And I think, I think I know what you're saying is the difference with something like Wicked City, and we can say this about like we can say this about all of the, a lot of the offerings from Streamline Pictures in the '90s. Wicked City, Golgo 13, Crying Freeman, um, Fist of the North Star, the movie. All of those movies had some level of sexuality and certainly had some level of violence. But the difference between how all of that was presented and how a lot of Western media would present it then and now is all of those productions. And again, Wicked City is a perfect example. It's presented to you like we're all adults here. We know you're an adult. We're going to treat you like an adult. We're not going to pretend we're not adults. We're not going to get bent out of shape over this. You know what you're watching. We know what we made. We know what we made for you to watch. And we know what we know what we're here for. So there's no, um, pearl clutching, if you will, for a uh, production like this or, or any of the others. You know, I, I remember there being occasional news stories back in the 90s when I was a kid about, uh, the, about the violence and the sexuality in some of these anime. And it would pop up and it would just sort of go away. Um, you know, you'd have stickers on the boxes at Blockbuster, you know, it's a definitely no one under 18 type of thing. But what was so funny is how many of us under 18 were watching them anyway. And overall, we turned out fine. So I think it's, we understood that this was folded into a particular type of story. Um, and I think when you understand that, and if you're being intellectually honest, it's like, okay, I'm not watching uh, Inuyasha. I'm not watching Dragon Ball Z. I'm watching Wicked City. I know what I'm getting into. And so um, I think that's sort of why people never dug too deep. One, the parents and, and people who would have been offended by this stuff just, I think, just didn't understand it and stayed away from it. I think it, it just it intimidated them a lot, which was great because those of us that understood and appreciated the art form just absorbed it, took it in and, and you know, enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, there, there's definitely, I, I would be very curious to see, I don't know if something with this subject matter and the way it was presented could be as coolly executed today because there seems to be a, a lot of spectacle around, oh, did you see that, that you know, when the lady, you know, uh, the, the, the naked woman turned into a demon and her blankety blanks turned into blanket, you know, all of that. I, I wonder yeah. how that would be presented because it it's um, so flawlessly executed, so perfectly folded into this weird world that we're watching. And at no point, yeah, you might be surprised, but the first time I saw it, the second time I saw it, and this most recent time I watched it, and there was plenty that I had forgotten, there was never a point where I was like, oh, that takes me out of it. Never once. I am. It sucks you in and it holds you in, and you're just on a ride for a solid, action-packed, beautiful 82 minutes. Yeah, you're definitely sucked into it. And like I said, it's it's definitely the the, the subject matter and the content. Um, yeah, it's all about it's all about the execution. Um, that's what really blew me away about it. I just lost my thought about what I was going to say. You mentioned uh, uh, the girls. Yeah, the women in the movie how they're depicted in different ways. They're, de you know, like Kanako, the spider lady at the beginning of the movie. Um, you just kind of seem like, you know, what started off as like an unassuming, you know, date and, you know, one night stand, you know, evolved, you know, straight up into sex horror, um, yeah. you know, of the, of the most, of the most, you know, efficiently grotesque kind. 
Um, right. It's it's definitely just you know like holy shit you know and that and I feel like that's what the movie definitely did so well is that it really knew how to deliver and and execute those moments and it does draw you in it it definitely does you know clear your emotions in a sense because you're just you're just compelled to see you know you're you're compelled to see like if you're kind of like you know of course like you said surprised and then you're just kind of like compelled to see how this is going to go down what's going to happen right. now. and it's and uh, honestly you think about the pacing of the movie and this is stuff that I had uh had to, to kind of look at um you know, from from just this weekend, you know, just kind of like looking at the movie again. It's just a lot of stuff. The subject matter is definitely something I never forgot. You know, when I initially saw it, and um, it's just it that those impacts. It never goes away after you see it. You know, I feel like there's certain things like yeah, you know, what's gonna happen, and it's like okay, I'm not really surprised by you know um, by boobs or nudity, but it's still the way that um, the portrayal is done in a sense where there's a this balance of or this synergy, I should say, of just you know, rawness and, you know, uh, uh, viscera, this rawness and viscera with, um, you know, style and, uh, you know, choreography and animation, how they're just kind of woven into no, it. It's, it's, be- it's beautiful. It's beautiful. You're absolutely beautifully woven together. It's, yeah, it's, it's like, yeah, it's synergy. That's exactly the, that, the word. And, and honestly, you know, going with that, you know, the narrative of the story, you're not lost, you know, honestly, like looking at it, it's like, um, the details are, are there, the plots there, the exposition is there to kind of keep driving you know, the story forward, um, which is honestly something I, I never really noticed until, you know, I watched it to, to review this, um, to, to review the movie. Um, you know, you're, you're, you just, it's almost like, it's, it's like a roller coaster ride. Like, you know, you like, usually with like a theme park ride, how you get plot, you get exposition and you get thrills. And then, you know, sometimes you get breaks, you know, to kind of like analyze narrative and kind of like, uh, you know, see where the characters are at in all of this. And one thing that really made, me like you know characters like Taki, Maki, even Giuseppe Maillard was that everyone was despite all the crazy stuff that was going on you know they knew they had jobs to do they had roles and they stayed true to those roles no matter how crazy right. the story went and that was just like that's one thing that really stuck with me more so than just the action sequences or the nudity was just sure. the characters I was really blown away by 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 Taki's portrayal like of course yeah he was you know, snark, he's like a snarky womanizer at some point, but he's definitely challenged on a lot of things that happen throughout the movie. You see a lot of vulnerability right. with him and you see how, um, you know, um, he has like... Uh, We're talking know, about Taki, right? Yeah, yeah, Taki. Yeah. yeah, Taki, the main character. Uh, yeah, it's like, of course, like, you know, he's like a secret agent. He works for the Black Guard at nighttime, at daytime. You know, he's, um, you know, kind of like... Uh, working in secret as like uh, you know like electronic salesman, which is like a typical job for like a, a Japanese person in the eighties or just Japan in general. Right. Um, and you know how he's using that to basically you know work his operation um, and to take on this this new new mission uh, with this other character from the Black Girl Makie, and how they're able to just you know how they're able to just kind of like work together and just keep moving forward throughout the plot no matter what, no matter what comes their way, and a lot of crazy just un believable things happen but they right. still stay true to themselves and in their mission and eventually also to each, each other which was you know really great to watch um, i think Maki the characters is, are really the characters are really strong you, you you do um this was something that i think because of the sex and the violence this could have been a throwaway they didn't have to build in as much depth to the characters as they did and i appreciate the fact that they did because you know, people, they would have packed people in, I think, regardless, just to see um, what is, would probably would have been billed by media as a spectacle of it. But no, there's a story there. There's real characters there. They're very three-dimensional. They have a backstory. You have that whole, um, you know, on, on top of Taki, you know, we start off with him, what we think, you know, having a one night stand and then boom, we're pulled into this world of, of, yeah. demons and the dark world the black world all that and then with with um what's the female's name again i'm blanking uh, makie makie when makie is um and fatal she encounters some bad guys and the one the one main bad guy towards the beginning uh ends up being her ex and you know so her you know we sort of learned that you know there's an element of the black world that sort of sees her as a traitor and she, you know she has to sort of maneuver doing what's right despite some of her people considering her a traitor. 
Um, yeah, and th there's, a, there's a lot of depth there. So it's not only is it beautifully done, uh, but you have real characters, you have a real story there. You also are not, for as much action as in this, as in this, as in this movie, you're not, you're not pummeled with jump cuts. One of the things that I, I, I think we're seeing too much of in a lot of action movies is it's, it's jump cut, jump cut, jump cut, bum, 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 and it, just, and it doesn't let go, and you sort of get exhausted by the time you get to the end. What Kawajiri does with this film is he almost sort of like moves around characters, which again, you see that in The Matrix. You know, it's like you'll see a character, you know, punching another character, but you go from the punching character's perspective to side profile view and then, you know, around. Um, you sort of almost get a 360 view of the action in, in animation, which is really impressive. That level of detail. Um, again, there, there isn't, whether it's character design, mechanical design, like the fact that they spent so much detail on the details of the Toyota crown that Taki drives. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. was, I believe there was a, a BMW 5 series. You know, you can identify the car. If you're a car guy, you can literally identify the cars in this animation. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and down yeah, to honestly. the the liquor bottles. To I, Some of my favorite scenes in this movie were just people sitting smoking. Just beautiful yeah. compositions. I think one of my favorite scenes, uh, one of my favorite shots in the movie, um, you mentioned the animation and the cars. Um, even though they used the they they recycled the the cells for that for this particular clip, but there's a clip of Taki, you know, driving through like a dark forest, and all you see are the are the headlights yes. driving up to where the yes. temple is. I was going to bring that up. That was, yes. that was one of the best. Like out of everything in that movie, and this like almost every frame of that movie is so beautifully shot and, and animated. Like that, that scene in particular, where you're that watching scene. a car drive through a forest in the dark, and so only thing the only thing that's illuminated. Are the headlights that are facing forward that, that are going right. so it's going away from you you've got the taillights lit up yeah, that yeah. level of detail that means they had to have gone out at night and either recorded something like that or sketched that so like had let's like okay yeah. we'd have we'd have a lower softer light coming off of the red taillights all the brightness is up front and then it travels again it's, it's little things like that I don't know how much again because I, I need to, again I need to figure out how to watch modern anime more. I don't know how much of that level of detail is being done today, but it was commonplace. It was people you know, people like Kawajiri and Otomo, all these folks just raised the bar. And again, yeah. that's why I have a hard time breaking away from yeah. these classics because it's just you notice things every time it you watch it. Oh wait, uh, I didn't realize uh, Golgo Thirteen. He's he's drinking uh, J and B whiskey. Or you can see, like, uh, the woman that he's talking to has a role. Like, it literally says Rolex on her watch. You know, those types of, th that level of detail, they don't have to do it, but they do it because they care that much about the reality that they're they're creating. And, yeah. man, mm -hmm. that's legendary. Those productions are hand-drawn. 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 That's the difference. They did it the hard way before, um, you know, uh, anime even changed they said they said they set a milestone with those movies that they had made that like it didn't the thing is it didn't last the bubble the bubble collapsed yes you know and the animation quality suffered in the 90s because of it you know the ovas eventually started dying down and you know there's limited production for a lot of things um you know but that's just kind of the thing it's just one of the one of the many you know um milestones that that the japanese achieved uh, right. In the eighties was just like this mind blowing, just just stunning um animation uh and choreography and storytelling. They were able to do all these things uh with that bubble. Um sure. and it's it was designed to stand withstand the test of time. And it certainly no, it, has. it really, it really did. And it's it's a shame that a lot of those animation houses, you know, I mean, they couldn't have lasted. It, it couldn't have lasted. It would have been nice to see if they did. Uh yeah. but these these folks went on to do other things. Um you know, but again, it, it's it's this beautiful sort of little time capsule in, you know, I would I would say in animation history, in cinema history, and we'll have it forever, which is which is awesome. It's um, cool. It's it's always worth checking out. Oh my god! And and that's and speaking of speaking of checking things out, I was I was thinking about, you know, when when I finished watching it, I'm like, okay, this is so unique. Again, just a really original piece. If I'm running, you know, 
the cult of film movie house mm -hmm. like we normally do what would i what would i do as a double bill what would my my double feature be with wicked city and i kind of came I, I look at it this way either go the route of sort of the dark actiony kawajiri involved uh films and do wicked city with go go 13 the professional but then i also thought about another one and i haven't watched it in a long time so i'm, I'm hoping it's aged well you know we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at it but the other natural one uh, because i believe it was same character design do you remember demon city shinjuku oh yeah yeah Shin yeah same, shinjuku? same house yeah yeah, okay, that's what I thought. I thought it was also Madhouse, but like uh, that's if yeah, that's, I were to that's do Kaw that's totally Kawajiri. Yeah, that's okay. Kaw yeah, that's what I thought. I couldn't I couldn't remember. I'm like that. It really looked like the same character designs, uh, but yeah, that would be totally. that would be. I would either do Wicked City and Gogo Thirteen, or Wicked City and Demon City Shinjuku would be my. Um, I think you'd probably throw the. Yeah, that's the, the only. I I would I would do Demon City Shinjuku because I think out of all the other productions that the Kawajiri and Studio Madhouse did, that was the production that came closest. Um, to what they were doing with uh, with Wicked City, that almost felt right. it almost felt like it could have been a, um, a loosely connected, you know, sequel in a sense sure. because there was a lot more. It was almost like, in my opinion, like you know, we talk about you know Demon City Shinjuku or Wicked City. It felt like a lot of things that were just being introduced in Wicked City were being you know built upon in Demon right. City Shinjuku, but they used different characters. They went a different you know, uh, they, went, they went a different route. They didn't use like Black Guard. But honestly, you can almost, you know, inter you can almost exchange certain characters and it could be like a direct sure. sequel. It's no, no absolutely. Of, no, there, there's you definitely go, you go the, archetype, this, the archetypes sort of match. Yeah, there's so much going on with it. I, I, I mentioned this to, to my brother a while ago, but I actually wanted to, uh, I actually did kind of make fan fiction of Wicked City. Um, really? You know, uh, yeah, in high school. Like, I was, I was oh, really nice. into film. I was really into anime. Uh, I dropped the fan fiction a long time ago, but it was basically supposed to be, you know, um, like a like a sequel. You know how a lot of Hollywood movies nowadays, they have, like, these legacy sequels where you have, of course. you know, parents who have kids and they, you know, have to pick up the story that, you know, left off years later. Well, I was going to do a story... Um, fan fiction about you know uh, uh taki and and makie's child or in my case it was going to be going to be twins so oh, all right <laughs> i wanted to do i wanted to do something um when it comes to like storytelling world building and stuff there's there's a lot of stuff that just gets touched on in wicked right. city but i wanted to find a make a story that expands on that and kind of mm -hmm. takes it to its next to its next destination where it's like sure. okay everything in wicked city hinged on that uh that you know that that peace treaty or whatever in which case right. it ended up being you know maki and taki uh having a having a child together and, and getting married that was the big that was a big MacGuffin of it all um right. i was going to do something where there's more stuff going on with the radicals of course there's there's a peace treaty in place but the radicals sure. aren't finished they're not finished with the black art or their world so they actually right. have a story like in between you know this story i was working on where um, the uh, the black guard gets um, kind of intercepted, or you have a lot of people. They have like a lot of uh, agents that work within, you know, uh, within the black guard. Ended up taking sure. it over, destroying the treaty, and they have an invasion, you know, of the real world, you know, with the demon world. So it, you know, there's tropes from different stories. You could even say, you know, kind of got some inspiration. You know what? You know what that reminds me of, yeah. man. Yeah. Huh? That rem it rem like you, you said, how Demon City Shinjuku in a way could be a de facto sequel to wicked city i was just yeah. thinking you think you talk about like a demonic invasion of of the human world uh yeah. those two features uh uratsuki doji legend of the overfiend and then legend oh, yeah, of the yeah. Moon, that's basically what it is like it's like okay yeah, yeah. So you had that dark that black world invasion uh, that's essentially what those two films are I don't, I don't know if you've watched them i when they came out those were the two I could not seem to ever manage to rent. Like they were, they were always either too high on the shelf. You would have to ask somebody, mm -hmm. and it's, I just didn't feel like asking somebody behind the <laughs> counter <laughs> about that. I'm just like, why do you want to watch this? But years later, I would watch those two, and yeah, that would be you know if you wanted to sort of go down like the mid to late '80s sci-fi horror. Um, a rabbit hole, you'd have Wicked City, Demon City Shinjuku, 
Legend of the Overfiend, Legend of the Demon Womb, because uh, they all sort of they all sort of live in that same area of that yeah scary, spooky, gory, mystical, um, apocalyptic, messianic, semi messianic sort of story. Uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah, this was. I'm glad that you uh, you brought this one up, man, because it. I was trying to re remember when the last time I started watching this maybe a couple years ago. And, and I, I just, I literally, I didn't finish it. Um, but yeah, just really sitting down and hunkering down and really absorbing this movie again uh, after probably over 10 years of not seeing it all the way through. Yeah. It's been this was just time. so fun. And you, again, whether you like anime or you don't, whether you like, um, it's just a great story. It's beautifully executed. Uh, I can't recommend it enough. This was a great recommendation, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. We had to do it. You mentioned, you know, so many, so many things about a lot of the, uh, you know, movies that we had watched. And I was like, we can see there's definitely one that we got to go oh, yeah. for since we're on the subject. So glad I got this one done. <laughs> no, for sure. <laughs> for sure. And, 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 and we'll definitely, you know, we'll, we'll definitely do, uh, you know, I think it's because unfortunately there, there is, there is a limit to all of this great, you know, late seventies, eighties and, 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 you know, '90s anime. So I, I can't do a cult of anime channel, but we'll we'll continue to pepper these these great works of anime in on the channel because they really are just independent of what medium, whether it's live action or animation. It's just incredible storytelling. Uh, it, it's it's so so good. But yeah, it's beautifully uh, animated, executed, oh, flawless. Load, load, loaded with uh, eye popping uh, visuals that you will never ever forget. <laughs> yeah, to, uh, yeah, to put it mildly, but uh, yeah, no, thanks again, man, and thank all of you uh, for tuning in. Again, if you like what we're doing here, please like, subscribe. Uh, if there's anything that related to what we review on the channel uh, that, that we're missing, please let us know. We, you know, we love suggestions, and, you know, comment below and mm -hmm. uh, check stuff out. But uh, yeah, we will uh, we'll catch you guys in the next one. Thank you again, man. I appreciate uh, I appreciate. <laughs> yeah, look out! <laughs> Night patrols on his way. Uh, well, I have to I have to bring the gear out because you know, uh, yeah, we can see there's a big has a big inspiration on Night Patrol as far as like okay. Story. So that was the reason why I wanted to just you know bring out bring out Night Patrol himself. No, so, it yeah, do kind of you cool. you wear it well, and you know this is I don't know if we did this in the last two. Uh, for people no, it, that, uh, that want to uh, check out what you're doing with Future Funk, where can where can they oh, find yeah. you? Man? Uh, well, right now I'm definitely on Instagram. That's the main place. Um, I uh, I moderate for a Facebook uh, page called the uh, Future Funk Vinyl Collectors Group. So I'm always active there. I was trying to like keep everyone's uh, activity posted, so everyone's uh, you know get, gets their um, gets their and it's inclusive for you know all the producers and, and uh, promoters. Uh, I also work with the collective uh, Team Discotech. Uh, we just got a residency in Koreatown in LA. Um, the Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Uh, actually, nice. we're going to be doing a party there. Yeah, that's cool. That's brand new. So we're going to be doing that uh, Thursday, I believe. So we're oh, working on that's that awesome. right now. Yeah, so that's that's going to be a regular thing. So we'll be performing again really soon. And, uh, you know, just bigger stuff. I'm just kind of a, a conduit for the community. Try to, like... Uh, try to, you know, promote all their stuff and, uh, you know, try to like get some inspiration myself. But yes, there is a story coming up. I've actually been working on something and I would like to introduce that draft to Kyle really soon. So, you know, a lot of stuff that we're doing, a lot of movie stuff, particularly stuff like Wicked City, is definitely something that parallels a lot with Night Patrol as a story. And that's something I'm, I'm definitely working on. And I, I can't wait to uh, share some details uh, with oh, Kyle. Yeah. yeah, I dig it. I dig I, it, man. Did you want to drop anything for the anime group? Uh, oh, for Gogo -Go Squirrels! Oh yeah, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I yeah, I also moderate for uh for uh, Gogo -Go Squirrels uh, pop culture uh pop culture uh I think it's called the pop culture community page. So if you yeah, just if you go to if you go to Facebook and type in Gogo -Go Squirrels, it should pop up. Yeah, yeah I've been, everything I've been sort of time. anime and uh, re related, you know. Yeah, anime, yeah, anime and uh, Japanese culture mainly, but yeah. yeah, usually anything else goes. A lot of like nerd culture or. You know, just about uh, roughly about anything kind of goes. Anything that kind of touches, you know, anime or J culture, uh, you know, I like to, you know, admin for there. So at some point, yeah, we like to probably, uh, we'll definitely be posting these videos on, over there. So um, you can definitely catch everything we're talking about here on that page. And uh, eventually, one of these days, uh, I'm gonna, you know, make use of my Twitter. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but definitely also Great. Discord and also Discord uh, as well. I'm also, I'm always on there. Uh, but yeah, I like to stay connected. I'm always posting stuff. Um, 
And uh, yeah. so fo follow this guy. He's doing incredible stuff. He's been he's been mixing music and he's been doing shows. And God damn, it's good, man. I have watching yeah. watching you Creative do process. what you do is, is it's really cool. I love it. Creative process, bro. That's what it's all about. You know, Absolutely. just see what we can do. Um, you know, eventually, you know, the more we do, the more, the more, the more we put out there in the universe, the more it comes back and the more we can put out again. So that's what it's all about. So I just want to thank you again, uh, for letting me be a part of your channel and uh, oh, yeah. platform with me and, uh, let me, uh, you know, just, uh, unload my ideas here for creative outlet. So it, it means a lot. Absolutely, man. And, and more to come, more to come. So yeah, thank all of you for watching. Check out our man here. Please like, follow, subscribe, love, hate, do whatever you want. And we will catch you guys in the next one. See you next time.